Okay, uh, hello again. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in this session, we will have Nate George working on a um, very interesting uh, study entitled The Weapons of Criticism. Bless you. And so the title is The Weapons of Criticism and the Criticism of Weapons, Sectarianism, Anti-Sectarianism, and the Struggle for the Lebanese State, 1975-1976. Um, Nate has just uh, graduated. He got his PhD in history at Rice University. His dissertation is entitled A Third World War, Revolution, Counter-Revolution, and Empire in Lebanon, 1967-1977. As you can see, there are quite interesting concepts in both titles. So we'll be looking forward to uh, around half an hour of um, uh, talk, lecture, and then we'll open the floor for a discussion. Nate, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers of the Winter School for bringing us all together. It's been a great week of discussions, and I've very much enjoyed meeting all the diverse participants. So I look forward to your harsh criticisms of what I have to say. Uh, to, I'm going to probably talk more about my approach and dissertation kind of as a whole in the theoretical and conceptual framework, and then we'll see how far into the actual case study, which uh, really, I, this is based on two chapters of my dissertation, the paper that you all have. I tried to cram into one, then plus a little bit of the introduction, and I, I'm not sure if that quite worked as a article, but maybe it's perhaps a story better told for a book. We'll see. So it comes out of my dissertation, which Adham uh, mentioned the title, there it is. Here's the thesis. Uh, While the war in Lebanon is commonly treated as an internal sectarian conflict, my dissertation instead understands Lebanon as an important setting in an international civil war over the direction of decolonization and the shape of political representation in the Eastern Mediterranean. So there's two factors really at big ones, especially that are at play in Lebanon at this time. It's the internal political structure and how that relates to the region, which is at this point in time really extremely connected to the question of Palestine. I look at three networks, basically, uh, over four scales. Uh, when I, I, I use these terms quite deliberately, revolution, was the revolutionary uh, or the coalition that became known as the Lebanese National Movement, which was a bunch of different parties uh, and figures and intellectuals, uh, was very closely aligned with the Palestine Liberation Organization. And I call them revolution, uh, I call this a network of revolution because very simply they were talking about revolution all the time. They used the term, they they put themselves in a global alignment uh, that was calling for and carrying out revolutions all across the world at this time. Uh, it was a tradition they tapped into in the, in the Cold War period of the late 60s and the late early 70s. If you said revolution, you knew that had to do with anti-colonialism or it had to do with socialism. There was a very, if you were on the conservative end of the political spectrum, you wouldn't have called yourself a revolutionary. Instead, uh, we tend to forget, and maybe the Arab uprisings of the last decade highlighted that with every revolution, there has to be a counter-revolution, otherwise you're not really fighting against anything. Uh, this group was a group of uh, parties and uh, militias and intellectuals as well, and it was called the Front for Freedom and Man in Lebanon. You can see that this is very much tied into uh, different, completely different ideologies that were that were being, uh, and and political alliances that were being formed in this period. Freedom and man being, of course, the rhetoric of the quote free world and the United States at the helm of that. On top of this network, 
and, and both, of the, both the right and the left, the revolution and the counter-revolution, they looked abroad, they learned and learned from uh, different experiences across the world, not just in the Arab region. And also U.S. empire or is, a, is the other network. I look at the connections between Washington, the embassies around the world, the, the secret services, the intelligence services, and what I call imperial administrators. You can track particular people across contexts, like for instance, I talk a lot about the network between that connected the counter-revolution and, and the imperial intervention in the, around the Congo in the early 1960s. You see a lot of these guys show up in Lebanon in the mid-70s. And people actually noticed that at the time and wondering what exactly was being planned. For instance, the U.S. Ambassador George McMurtry Godley, he went from Congo to Laos to Lebanon, like, where all of these have extremely um, important counterinsurgencies going on. Then you have the scales that all of these networks were fighting, the internal Lebanese scale and the Arab-Arab uh, regional contest, a contest between the Arabs and Israel, and how this all of these factors affected the global balance of power between the USSR. Uh, quickly, uh, the Third World War is kind of like a substitute term for the global Cold War that's become fashionable in academia lately. I, I, I see it as emphasizing the concept of the Third World and its importance as the main battlefield in the Cold War. It wasn't cold. So we should not call it that. And there's also a continuity between the First and Second World Wars here that I'm implying that uh, I'd like to make the connection. And it, this term was also used by the actors themselves occasionally, like uh, Charles Malik on the right actually was talking about third, we need to prevent and work, and we're fighting the Third World War whether we know it or not. The PFLP and uh, their allies were sometimes use this term. Henry Kissinger sometimes use this term. It, so I found it evocative. Here's some an image to maybe show you that uh, how this Third World War was conceived. This is a poster on the on the left here, seeing a picture of a massacre in Vietnam. On the right, you see the Der Yassin massacre in Palestine. In the middle, you have uh, Nixon and Golda Meir. Zionism, imperialism. Uh, this is a poster from the Arab Liberation Front active in Lebanon. This is the pro-Iraqi Ba'ath Party uh, Palestinian faction. But this poster was preserved, I found, in the U.S. National Archives. So we thank them for preserving the memory, I suppose. How I see myself contributing to the historiography is basic and differentiating myself is in two different bodies of liber literature. First of all, the Lebanese Civil War literature itself, which is divided between studies that just see it as a competition between self-contained, well-defined, and natural religious sects. And then there's a popular thesis called the War of Others, that this was a, a competition between outside powers on Lebanese soil, not a battle between the Lebanese themselves. And then you have also Marxian literature that focuses on the internal imbalance of social and political power, but doesn't really focus on the international sphere of what's going on. And it tends to downplay um, sectarian cleavages, basically. Uh, I also am intervening in the historiography of U.S. foreign relations. I see myself as part of a broader trend that's trying to internationalize the study of U.S. diplomatic history. I interweave Arab and American agency. I don't just look at American sources to tell the story. Uh, and I don't just look at archival local sources, but also the historiography, how, how people in the region have uh, understood the conflict. And I place U.S. policy in Lebanon and the Arab East within a broader imperial framework that connects uh, with the rest, Africa, Asia, Latin America, seeing it as one, uh, try to, trying to look at it as one big field. Here's a list of uh, many of the, I did lots of archival research in the U.S., the U.K., and Lebanon, basically, the, and I 
these are the primary archives that I consulted according and in addition to lots of um, published memoirs and and and, uh, and journals and books in uh, in uh, Lebanon and elsewhere. So here, let's talk about a little bit what's going on. This is there is a major culture of protest and uh, intellectual and social ferment in Lebanon in the, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. There were massive student strikes, workers' uh, unrest was uh, going on all the time, and of course you had the Palestinian uh, organizations that were based there and fighting indeed from Lebanon. You can see here on the on the right is a student from the American University of Beirut going down south to uh, learn, coming into contact with guerrilla warfare and you know having a jolly time while doing it. Appears uh, here is a the AUB had massive student strikes in this period. This is a picture of. Uh, the student assembly voting to go on strike. This is a picture of a funeral procession uh, for fallen Fideiyin. And at the same time, this was a, a multi-sectarian uh, culture of protest that was going on. It didn't always mean that everybody was anti-religious. Uh, I would Bring back that I find the term that in Osama Makasi's new work about the ecumenical frame, how uh, different religious uh, figures and groups would would come together, not necessarily to um, necessarily they're not about tran they transcend their differences politically, but they preserve their identity. Here you can see uh, at a, this is at a rally for the the imprisoned uh, Greek Catholic bishop Capucci. And you can see Arafat and Musa Sadr. This is a Greek Catholic uh, priest, uh, uh, Sunni figure Abu Yad, and and the and that's a, and a Shia Imam. I'm not sure who that is. Right there, you have a different culture with the counter-revolutionary figures here. There, this is pictures from the war. Actually, um, I go. I'm not really going to be able to talk about the lot of work that I've done on this. And the, especially focusing on the role of Charles Malik as the kind of intell main intellectual theorist of this kind of movement and orientation for Lebanon, you can see they they literally tapped into the the European traditions of counter-revolution and fascism quite explicitly. Here, there, the text is referring to the heroes of Sparta and Sur, which also brings in Lebanon as Sewer being the uh, Tyre, ancient Phoenician city. And so they're able to merge and create their own international kind of or a parochial ideology that also had its international um, influences and, and, and um, uh, implications. You can see this again here. Here's uh, the leader of the a poster for the Lebanese forces. It comes at a later period, clearly imitating um, the American uh, Uncle Sam figure. Monsieur Jamel wants you. F our Lebanon needs you, basically. They talk about the United Lebanese States. Uh, this is after uh, Monsieur Jamel is elected president. There's very much this discursive and practical world of linkages between areas. This is Charles Malik actually himself. He went and visited South Africa in the early 70s, violating the international boycott or crossing the picket line, for instance. And he wrote to them quite warmly, expressing his support. And he believed in this kind of hierarchical system. And then you have the US imperial kind of gaze and looking at it in geopolitics. I've talked about a little bit. Won't go too much further. This is actually a cartoon. That was uh, in after the, the this ambassador that I already mentioned, who spent time in Godly and um, spent time in the Congo and Laos. This is the cartoon making fun of him. It says, "Where are the Fidein? He's coming out as a as the American cowboy, going to come save uh, or come fight the the bad guys." So let's get into 
kind of more the theoretical framework here to kind of build upon what Adham presented us with today uh, about the his history and the historical sociology of the Lebanese political arrangement I think is extremely important. And my main point is that we need to keep in mind that the inhabitants of Lebanon and indeed the rest of the region did not create the system of political sectarianism on their own. Rather, the sectarian regime was formed and reformed at several points in unequal interaction with numerous imperial powers at several points. Uh, drawing on the work on racialization in other contexts, uh, I, and the work of Patrick Wolf in particular, I argue that the configuration of Lebanon's sectarian regime, quote, registers the state of colonial hostilities. Meaning that you can see that when the, the, when the regime was formed in its different points right here, I'll kind of go through it quickly. And the Mutasarafi of Mount Lebanon after the War of 1860, you had the British and the French and European powers come to a deal with the Ottomans uh, to represent the, the residents of Mount Lebanon in a particular way. And this was very anti-democratic. This was, uh, the idea was to impose a, a elites that all the empires could basically trust and there would be no threat of popular really representation. And uh, you can, especially Osama Maktasi's work goes into this a lot. And key, some other the key um, references that I draw from uh, Osama Maktasi's work on uh, culture of sectarianism in the age of coexistence, Hanna Batatu's historical, historical sociology in a way, but his, the way that he deals with uh, class and race, class and ethnicity and sect all together, I think uh, is a very valuable approach that um, could be revived. Abdul Razak Al-Takriti's work on the, the revolution in Oman and uh, Arab republicanism has been influential, and Arno Mayer's work on the international civil war in Europe, really, that between the First and Second World Wars, I found very, um, very inspiring. So then again, you have the colonial mandate system. Uh, in 1920, uh, Ottoman sovereignty is destroyed, and you have a new balance of power in the region, and the, the, Briti the French um, impose their rule in Lebanon and Syria. Syria is split into five different states. That plan is foiled by numerous revolts of Syrians. And, but in Lebanon, you have, they appoint a constitutional council, and uh, Michel Shiha especially um, designs this system of political sectarianism where he, everything is um, apportioned by sects. So let me get into this more quickly. The sectarian regime of the First Republic, only Maronite Christians could or did hold the offices of the presidency, which was extraordinarily powerful. It formed the cabinet, it dissolved the parliament if it wished, it formed and canceled the cabinet. Uh, the commander of the armed forces what had to be a Maronite, the chief of military intelligence was a Maronite, and eventually after the Central Bank was founded, and the work of Hisham Safiuddin is very important on this. It also, um, what came to be controlled uh, uh, by Maronite figures, and not only just Maronite, but Maronite from Mount Lebanon, and so you have a very kind of narrow base for the the the, the major de decision making powers, the sovereign powers of the state were very much in a small group of. Um, people that were limited by their religious affiliation. In addition to that, there was, in Parliament, there was a six to five Christian majority enforced in Parliament. And the legitimating factor for this was one census carried out in 1932. The Prime Minister was Sunni and the, and the, and the Speaker of Parliament Shi. I don't really have time to go into all of these uh, developments on the road to war here, but Let's see. One thing I'd like to mention is that, so here we are, the late 60s, the Palestinian presence has actually been legalized by, the Palestinian armed presence has been legalized by the Lebanese state, and there's been a, there's a lot of polarizing um, political organization going on. And 
there's been numerous battles. Most recently, in 1973, there was a there was a battle between the Lebanese army and the Palestinians and their supporters. And there was the Arab-Israeli War of 1973, which really put the region on a track for an international negotiations led by the United States to try to end this series of Arab-Israeli wars and to come to a settlement on the Palestinian question. So there's a, and the Palestinians, by the way, then are only basically eventually kicked out of Jordan and they're not really operating freely in Syria anymore by this point or, so they're only in Lebanon, they become kind of pinned in Lebanon and this is very kind of, this is very much the plan of the United States as well to slowly kind of um, move them out of the picture. So in 75, you, see, you can see already in the first months, there's so many things going on. The, there's battles in the south between the Israelis and the Fidei'in, which ends up, as usual, with extremely um, disproportionate Israeli raids in Lebanon. It's been, they've been, for the last, for 10 years, basically, Lebanon's been subjected to these Israeli raids while the Lebanese government basically stood aside. The village of Kfar Shuba, is destroyed by Israel completely in January 1975. And the government doesn't provide new homes for the, the villagers. This creates protests by their allies in Beirut. And the villagers are really, f and are feeling very abandoned by the government. In February and March, there's a, fish there's a fisherman's protest that ends with the assassination of a former parliamentarian there, who's a very popular figure. Protests erupt across the country. There's also, in support of the fishermen, the vast majority, and then also counter protests in support of the army, uh, mainly by, um, in the in Maronite Christian areas as well. So on Sunday, April 13th, we probably already know, many people know, this is the classic beginning of the Civil War. Four are killed in an attack on a phalange gathering at a church, and then 29 uh, passengers on, on a bus passing through the neighborhood are massacred, and civil violence then generalizes. Okay, got about hopefully 10 minutes here to explain <laughs> the 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 broader story here of what this paper tries to deal with and what the 75, 76 war was about, in my estimation. So. After several rounds of local fighting, you kind of, by August 1975, there becomes three clear political camps in Lebanon. One hand, a restoration camp, which, which is adamantly against um, uh, modifying the constitution or the unwritten national pact, which uh, controls the sectarian arrangement of the regime. Then you have and this is advocated by the Front for Freedom and Man, the almost entirely Maronite Christian alliance. Then you have a, the, the notable, kind of the political establishment and really the, the, and the Sunni uh, Zorma are the one that are really advocating for participation paradigm where they would change the six to five representation to 50-50, balance the prerogatives of the Sunni prime minister and the and the Maronite president, and so there would be a, a balance, basically. But this, the Front for Freedom and Man, on the one hand, had a large political base, whereas by this point in time, the political, uh, the Sunni notables have really lost their, and the Shi, the Muslim political establishment really has lost their uh, popular base to the parties of the national movement and um, the PLO who are calling now, the PLO is really not, is not making any comments about internal Lebanese politics at this time, but the, Le the national movement comes out with this transitional program for the democratic reform of the political system in Lebanon, calling for the abolition of sectarian political representation, a new electoral system that gives proportional representation, covering Lebanon as a single district, a Voluntary personal status code. Almost all Arab countries, I believe, ha and, and even including uh, uh, Israel, but by the way, has no, they don't have civil personal status laws, and that's kind of been the sticking point of 
secularism and sectarianism in the Middle East, uh, even the revolutionary regimes did not, um, uh, the quote, revolutionary regimes did not cancel sectarian personal status laws, but here the call was to make an optional one for people who wanted it. And it, the other main point was to support the Palestinian liberation struggle. It also called for abolition of discriminatory, discriminatory laws against women, a new, national, a, a new nationality law, the unrestricted formation of political parties and unions. These were actually, even though Lebanon was much freer than most other Arab countries, there were strict laws that, um, that govern political rep, um, organization. And it was actually Kamal Jimblatz, the leader of the national movement that legalized the non-sectarian parties who were actually like the Ba'ath, the Communist Party. They were illegal because they were considered to be, quote, foreign or not Lebanese in origin. And there was, a, after he legalized them, there was a counter movement to um, Re, um, re, to make them illegal again. So there's this whole period that sees a lot of contestation. These are the different, the 17 groups and parties that were signatories of this. I, I can't, I don't have time to go into all this right now. But so we can talk about this. It can, Arab nationalists, Syrian nationalists, social democrats, local, um, organizations, Nasserists, uh, the, the South was very, like the cultural club of the South was a active group um, in, in the South. The Association of Makassid graduates, this was a cross-sectarian coalition. Communists of different, several different communist parties were active in Lebanon at this time. And the, just to tell you a little bit more, about, we need to, the key figure of all this is really Kamal Jumblat. He was the, 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 the Druze feudal lord. He was the number one kind of Druze communal figure in Lebanon this country, uh, at this time. His son, Willie Jumblat, I'm sure you all know. Um, much different from his son, by the way. Uh, he founded the Progressive Socialist Party in 1949. He was very active in the Afro-Asian movement. Here you can see him in India. He took many trips to India. To He was very into yoga and Hindu mysticism, and he was a vegetarian. Basically, he was hipster 50 years ahead of time, I guess. And he kind of, he had a completely kind of different, we've been talking a lot about the the regimes in Syria and Iraq and, and things like that. His conception and the conception of Arabism that came into play at this uh, time in Lebanon was very much different from this military, these military regimes basically, and it was a buildup of and a group of, you know, political parties and civil society organizations to use the, the the current term, uh, that came together around these specific points in the program, and these groups had been fighting with each other for a long time before that. Okay, we're running out of time, but okay. So basically, the title comes to the idea that uh, the weapons of criticism, the criticism of weapons. Eventually, the, the, the Lebanese right is really not able to come up with any sort of program for reform inside the country. They basically just shut down all dialogue, and eventually, after several rounds of fighting, actually, Abdul Harim Khaddam comes in and sets up this committee who's the Syrian foreign minister, brings together the most notable figures in the country to discuss um, the, how, how they can get out of this impasse, basically. And to cut the story short, basically, uh, they agree to the reform suggested by the Lebanese national movement to abolish the sectarian clauses from the Constitution, to establish a socio-economic council representing everybody, to um, abolish it from parliamentary representation, and lower the voting age. These are the recommendations of the committee, which are then um, met with a basically a campaign of terror on the right. This is the uh, destruction of the Carantina slums in East Beirut, where Palestinians and 
uh, various Le poor Lebanese uh, groups of Kurds that were in Lebanon were living in these informal shanty towns. Syrians, let's, this is Syrian workers live there. And it was the property of the Maronite church. So there was a class issue going on here too. And just want to point out this weapon, right? This is a phalangist militiaman uh, evicting a family and they're burning down their house. This gun is a M1 carbine rifle, which I found was sent from the United States in about 1970. They sent a shipment of thousands of rifles from uh, through the fascist regime of Greece at the time. And Lebanese army officials went to Greece to pick up these weapons to arm against the left and the Palestinians. So, there's the war spirals out of control into campaigns of uh, mostly what I, w I call them campaigns of red and white terror. Th this going after the civil wars and revolution in in uh, Russia and China, we had red armies of people who wanted to revise the regime and white armies of people who wanted to restore and oppose the regime. Uh, and it escalates in, in, in Lebanon, the army splits in very classic fashion. Uh, they, all of a sudden in the spring, basically the, the, the Lebanese national movement is in control of most of the country. You start to have a re uh, assessment from many areas, uh, intellectuals started to, that were on the fence before were kind of saw and started to lean towards the revision of the system. And just one um, example of that, here's Kamal Salibi, he's a, he was, he's, he's a very famous Lebanese historian, a, uh, not a radical by any means. He was actually the advisor of the Lebanese, uh, phalan like the phalangist uh, student group at AUB, and he called in the end by the at this time, May 1976, for Lebanon basically to embrace the Arab option and to become the vanguard of true Arabism and and to merge, you know, uh, uh, to give up the sectarian arrangement basically. So that kind of ends uh, when the you have a regional and international agreement basically to prevent the sectarian regime from being changed. Uh, I don't have time to go into this right now. We can, I'm happy to answer questions about, basically the United States arranges a, the, for the Syrian army to intervene and, and, and fight and destroy the, the Lebanese national movement and the PLO alliance. They fight side by side with the right wing Christian parties that they had been opposed to for a long time. And this was, this was a difficult thing to arrange because then if Syria entered, then uh, Israel might too. So the United States created a, a, an agreement uh, basically and coordinated between the Lebanese right, the Israelis and the Syrians to make sure that there wouldn't be a, that the war in Lebanon wouldn't explode into a bigger regional conflagration. Uh, quickly, last two points of the, there's many theories of the Kissinger plan in Lebanon and what it is and what it isn't. Uh, I have some quotes here uh, from Kissinger. This is what his, there was a, there's an, there's the idea that uh, there's some that may, many that make the claim that Kissinger wanted the Lebanese Christians to basically give up and move out and, and give the country up to the Palestinians. This is a theory in the right wing. Uh, circles. Basically, the president of Lebanon, Suleiman Frangi, was a big advocate of this theory, that they were told basically to give up and and get out. But that's not really what wanted to happen. Kissinger recognized that deconfessionalization would make the Christians a quote permanent minority, and Lebanon would become a pure Arab and radical state, which neither Syria or Israel want on their borders. And so. He wanted to prevent this regional destabilization, which would upset his um, plans to settle the question of Palestine. Uh, one, you'll, you'll appreciate this message that he sent to uh, Hafez al-Assad on 7th of August, 1976, basically a few days before the Tel Zatar uh, refugee camp was completely overrun and destroyed with Syrian and, uh, and, and the Lebanese front basically committed a huge massacre there. 
he told Ahafaz al-Assad, there is no reward for losing in moderation and no substitute in some situations for a military victory. A few days later, Syrian green light is given, the Tel Azatar refugee camp is overrun, and that's pretty much the end of the uh, war. Kamal Jambat is assassinated the next year, and the sort of the the, sol the political solvent holding together the Lebanese parties and the Palestinian parties is starts to really break away, and takes many years actually for the final break to occur. And Israel evades in 1982 and really finishes the job. But this is a story that I'm trying to tell, I suppose. Uh, the main con conclusions here are uh, of my whole project is kind of to retrieve the history of explicit Arab anti-sectarianism, also revive the history of counter-revolutionary mass movements on the other hand on the right and their international ideological ties, while all the while seeing how this was part of a broader global war for um, control of the region, basically. Simple as that. I find new evidence of material and political intervention by the United States, coordination and inspiration. So without further ado, I can go in. Happy to discuss many of the details that I certainly left out. It's a very complicated time, and I very much look forward to hearing Dr. Sauli's comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nate, very much. I, I read Nate's work, and I think it's uh, quite fascinating. I, let me start by saying I hope this comes out soon in, in a book format. Why? Well, basically because you provoke all the interesting questions we're still facing in the Arab world. Uh, by taking the case of Lebanon, you show that sectarianism is one factor. It's not the only factor. And going back to the 70s, you, uh, the work shows how there were movements actually trying to transcend sectarianism. But also it shows the dynamism of a country like Lebanon, tiny country like Lebanon back in the 60s and 70s with various ideological movements. So it's not only sects, uh, it's not only uh, movements, but you also there are ideological divisions um, but then there is also the national question, which I'll, I'll come back to. Uh, Nate's work also, it's been done, but he highlights it in an interesting way, contextualizing Lebanon as a theater of a world war, nicely put as the third world war, giving the Cold War a different discursive um, meaning. Uh, the, the work is rich, as you would expect from uh, a very competent uh, historian. It's quite detailed, uh, unlike uh, studies you get in political science where uh, sometimes we don't dig enough. So, um, in fact, I was talking to Nate earlier and I thought um, history is, is quite liberating, really, for, for everyone. So, even if you're a political scientist, I'd always urge people looking at the case to start with the history book, whether it's Lebanon or Iraq or um, I had several questions, but then uh, Nate addressed them in the presentation. They're quite missing in the, um, in the paper you sent. It, it, the paper felt it was uprooted from, an, from a study. I assume it's your, your dissertation or your thesis. Yeah. So, but then you addressed them pretty well uh, in terms of the main research aims of the paper, some uh, of the concepts you've looked at which were a bit missing in this one. I, I didn't know where you were going, but that, that, uh, your presentation made things quite um, clear. Regarding the actual s substance, I felt at some points um, there are two areas that were quite missing, which would, maybe you've addressed them in different chapters, I don't know, but at least in the, uh, the piece I read. One is, um, the question on the national identity question. Is Lebanon an Arab state or is Lebanon a Lebanese state? And that's, that adds an extra layer to understand such a complex uh, context as Lebanon's. 
So I felt you didn't give that, at least in this piece, you didn't give that the analytical weight it requires. A second point has to do with uh, also missing is the, the Shia revolution in this process. You do argue, interestingly, that there were a group of politicians who wanted to preserve the existence, or reform it, let's put it that way. The you put it in the cat category of participation, which is quite, it's a reformist movement. Um, what's his name? Sadr played there in it. Musa Sadr yeah. played an important role. So it wasn't only Sunni politicians. Yeah, it was actually a Shia reformer mm -hmm. um, trying to reform the system in a way that would give his own sectarian community a stronger presence in the state, which continues to be Amal movements, uh, strategic choices and goals in Lebanon. Unlike, unlike Hezbollah. So I felt that would have given um, the analysis an extra level um, of um, richness. It will uh, enrich the story. Um, I'm still interested, however, in the few concepts you use. Um, you're probably in history, you probably you're not, ex I don't know, you could correct me. I don't know to what extent you're expected to come up with a conceptual framework or analytical framework. But what do we do with the concepts such as revolution and counter-revolution? They might sound, uh, to, or to what extent are they actually accurate? Or are you, as a historian, as a researcher, entering into the political discourse of that period? In other words, have you, you, it seems to me you just accept that Kamal Jamblat's national movement was, uh, he was trying to establish a revolution. What do you do with those who suggest, well, Kamal Jamblat was also quite strategic early on. He's the, the leader of a Druze community. His community's political weight was more or less demoted with the establishment of the state of Lebanon. And he made a strategic move and adopted secular ideological frameworks and wanted to reform or revolt against the existing political system in order to give himself and possibly his community a role. I'm not adopting this argument, I'm just well, I just want to see what you make of it. S specifically because you have adopted the terms of revolution and counter-revolution. In your three networks, which forms an interesting analytical framework with various factors, domestic revolution, a counter-revolution, or the Lebanese right who were quite scared actually. They, they had their own fears and didn't want to change in the system, but then you include U.S. imperial power. Certainly there is an American intervention in Lebanon, quite salient, but what do we do with other forms of um, interventions? Starting with the Soviets, but also, what do you do with uh, interpretations that treat the Palestinian intervention as a sort of occupation of, of segments or parts of Lebanon? Uh, here, this, the story of the revolution, counter-revolution, -re becomes more complex. So you have, on the one hand, Syria, which was anti-American to a large extent, an ally of the Soviet Union, yet the same player is intervening in Lebanon to, in your own uh, words, destroy a revolution. And destroy who? Well, the Palestinian <laughs> armed movement, which uh, Syria was supposed to be, uh, you know, an ally of. Is this a, a tragedy of Middle East politics where things become blurry? Uh, there are, there are, it resonates with things that are, ha have happened in the last five or six years. Iran suppo supposedly um, fights for the oppressed in the world, and then you see it supporting Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Realists in IR, in the 
realist school would, would say th these are part of the, the tragedies of politics, you know. You have good intentions, ideological intentions, but you end up in a big mess. Think of America and the Vietnam War. So I'd be interested to see what you do with, with people who would ask you uh, to, to flesh out a bit the um, concepts such as river. The last point is on sectarianism, given the needs of this uh, school. How do you address sectarianism? The left in Lebanon has its own interpretation of, of sectarianism. And the right has its own uh, interpretation, and those in the middle have their own interpretation. These were some of the questions that I thought would be good to elaborate on. My final point is, I hope, I don't know what your future research questions are or um, curiosities are, but I hope you do something similar about Iraq uh, from a historian's um, approach. Thank you, that's me. Uh, do you want to address these or should we get uh, some? I'll address them. Okay, go ahead. Thank you so much for these comments. Um, lots to talk about here. I think I can get through them fairly quickly. The last, I'll we'll start with how do you approach sectarianism? I forgot to mention during the presentation a little bit more clearly what, I'm, I don't subscribe to the idea that there's one sectarianism. I think that we have to look at um, sectarian situations in individual areas and locations, which are determined mostly, I think, by the st particular state political arrangements, which uh, in Lebanon is obviously different than other con Arab countries, especially at this time. So when I'm talking about sectarianism here, political sectarianism, which I kept using, uh, I'm talking about the, the entire system of political representation in Lebanon was based on sectarian quotas and certain offices being reserved for certain people. This was not to ensure equality, actually. This is a hierarchy, a very clear hierarchy. So when I'm talking about abolishing sectarianism, I don't mean, and it's not that, I don't mean that there is, um, every sectarian, I sectarian bias or idea is going to be washed away with the, with the, with the cancellation of uh, discriminatory laws, but as we have looked at and as we have seen across the world, when you, in situations where there's racism and, and you know, actual legal regimes that um, discriminate against people, usually what happens is, it's, al it's always an argument, we need to change the mind before we change the law. That never really works out anywhere. You'll never change the mind if the law is constantly enforced in, in, in that particular way. So um, when I'm talking about sectarianism, I'm, I'm not necessary. I think for most part, I'm, I'm talking about the political arrangement of Lebanon, the regime, the sectarian regime. Uh, and I think on the other hand, there is, I think that uh, especially leftists and nationalist historians have kind of Ta'afi has been the opposite of uh, Kaumia or Wataniya, basically, like you were saying, or, or class, basically. And like in your lecture today, you know, anybody that's against them is accused of being sectarianism, being, to the, being sectarian. Yeah, definitely. I think that we need to look at, there are these major differences. I mean, Christians uh, in Lebanon exp and lived in a, and in the whole Arab world, we're living in a Ottoman Islamic imperial order that didn't, that put them at a particular um, notch in the totem pole in in the in the Ottoman imperial order, which was not equal. It was only after the, as Makassi and many others have argued, that when the Ottomans tried to switch from an imperial sovereignty to the idea of a Ottomanism, that popular sectarian politics. Um, became mobilized because there was the idea that we should be equal. So Tanya Shaheen's rebellion in 1860 was about implementing equality in Lebanon where it wasn't even thought of before. So I guess I want to separate attitudes, sectarian attitudes, my point is, from sectarian laws and political representation. So that's what I'm talking about here, especially. 
And, and once we do that, we can kind of, let's go to the question about Kamal Jambat. This is a, I get this all the time. It's not even, not, there's nobody that I've ever seen that's been, there's no sort of, there's so much controversy about who he is and what he stands for and what he was trying to do. I talked to Lebanese leftists and, you know, most of them actually are very, they think he is just a Druze sectarian leader or some, you know, I talked to, I did an interview with two old uh, Marxist ad, uh, um, militants or activists from the 70s and one, they're together and I asked, what do you think of Kamal Jambat? One said, I think he, there's nothing revolutionary about this guy. He was just trying to use us for his movement. And then the other guy said, well, if Kamal Jambat um, didn't do what he did, we wouldn't have never come together. We would have never had this power that we they had. He, and then as soon as he was killed, it all fell apart. So that's kind of the, and then on the right wing, I, even on the right wing, actually, if the people I've talked to are completely different. Some people have think that, like I talked to, um, well, and it doesn't really matter who right now. But anyway, some people think that he is kind of this, they see him from another light, that he's this Nahdawi intellectual figure that did, um, you know, he always was committed to coexistence and tried to bring in Christians and Muslims and Druze together. And, you know, he was a gentleman and things like that. And then actually in the Falange newspaper of the time, they described him of 1975-76, they described him as the Antichrist. So, like, you have an entire range of opinions. Uh, most people haven't actually looked, and they usually don't base those opinions off of any evidence or historical analysis based on other than their general feelings. So me looking through and now this period and like basically day by day detail, it's, uh, it's been certainly interesting. I think I, have, uh, I can see the, the role that he played is a lot more consistent than I think people give him credit for, but I think there's um, more work to be done on that. Uh, I don't know, I mean, everybody thinks that they're, okay. you know, I, can a Druze person, there's this paradigm of interpreting sectarianism in Lebanon that unless you're Christian, basically, you can't possibly be sincere at calling for the abolition of sectarianism. I just don't agree with that. I think you know, if you're, obviously, the, the deal was bad for Muslims in general, Shia in particular, so I don't, and Druze uh, as well, so I just, and other ortho, other Christians, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was really just Maronite Christians that had this power that was, um, not, that was unequal basically, so uh, yeah, it makes more sense for, it's totally normal that Maronite Christians would form the base of the the political order, the conservationist, the counter-revolutionary position, and that non-Christians would make up the uh, the opposition, but of course that comes with baggage too, definitely. And there's sectarian massacres on both sides, not equal. Most, most by far, the most uh, kind of crimes and ethnic cleansing was carried out by uh, the, the right wing, but we can talk about that later. Um, Musa, I do talk about, in the dissertation, I talk about Musa Sadr and, um, and the Shia movement. And, and that was uh, also kind of, he was kind of in the middle of these two groups, uh, these broad categories, revolution and counter-revolution, ultimately he was much more trying to prevent, he, his kind of mission was to, you saw that the Shia were being organized by the left wing and the nationalist parties and he wanted to prevent that and say, you know, attach them to the Lebanese sectarian system. So ultimately he kind of, he taught, he played with the, rev the language of revolution actually. He talked about, he had these big rallies. He said, we need to carry arms and perhaps go against the Lebanese state if they don't defend us and respect the South and uh, things like that. But then and when the time came, he, um, switched eventually. And I mean, he, one, he actually signed up with the, transitional program and then he uh, left it later and went to the Syrian uh, preservation side. I don't want to talk too much longer but revolution, okay, am I entering the political discourse of the period? Ye yes, I want to return to the, 
uh, as a historian, this is what I think we do. We want to look and see the rhetoric, the original rhetoric of the period at the time, and in its context, and 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 think about it and use and see how that's different from it is from what it is today. I don't think that necessarily means that. I mean, as I said, the revol like the revolutionaries define themselves by this going with this tradition. I, not necessarily a value judgment might sound like one. I, I don't. I think there's an objective quality to it, and I go. There's a large part of my dissertation is about Charles Malik and literally calling for counter-revolution, literally calling for um, the breakup of the Middle East and sect sectarian states, literally calling for Lebanon to be and working towards in his past career um, for Lebanon to have a deal with the imperial power to protect it at all times. So. I just haven't had time to talk about that. Okay. Thank you.